This is quite a huge topic. Uh, I've been working on this for over a decade, and I only understand half of the things that I talk about myself. But hopefully, uh, this uh, talk today will give you a little better understanding of what it is and how it can be used. So uh, I'm going to do a little dialogue, have some slider questions that we can talk around. And then I'm going to go into a little more specifically what we're actually uh, trying to build in EDSSI L2 in regards to e-signatures. Uh, and I'm also going to explore uh, slightly some other topics that we are working on in uh, the Activity 2 in this project. And I'm going to round off with some more questions and dialogue. So, as you see, I like dialogue. So is there any questions that you would like to raise during my presentations, feel free to just raise your hand and we'll, we'll take that and sort of go where you are interested because, as I said, this is a huge topic. I'll only be able to cover parts of it today. So, but hopefully it'll be the part that are interesting for you. So why are we here today? Um, I'm going to sort of backtrack a little to actually arrive at that specific questions. Uh, so the first thing that I see, so what is the Erasmus program all about? And this will be sort of very generalized because it's about a lot of different things. But for me, the Erasmus program is about the mobility of students in Europe. And then what it was the EDSSI L1 project all about? Because that's finalized now. So again, this was about a lot of things, but for me, primarily it was about digitalizing or making the mobility of students possible in the, with the new, hopefully in many cases easier, ways of communicating and agreement, agreeing on the different things that needs to be in place for this mobility to actually happen. And what is the EDSSI L2 project all about? So we mentioned that slightly yesterday, uh, and for me it's about taking this step one this one step further. So basically looking at what, what have we built, what do we have, what do we need, and how can we go there? What are the different standardizations, the different tools and different technologies that we can use to make the whole mobility of students within the Erasmus program even better, easier, more secure, and uh, whatever is needed to, to make it a, a good um, experience for everyone, both the students, but also all the institutions and uh, organizations that are working in the program. So, why are we here today? That's very much connected to this last question. What do you all want or need? So, you're invited here as stakeholders in, uh, in the Erasmus context. So, we are very interested in project. What is it that you see is important? So one of the points that I see with this forum is to sort of give you the foundation of understanding what it is we're doing so that you then can give us input and feedback on what we're doing to make sure that we're actually doing the right things. Uh, sometimes when, when you work in isolation, it can be easy to think that you're doing the right things, but it's also good to sort of reach out and check what, what, what's actually needed. So that's... Uh, one of the, hopefully, things that we'll be able to do today. So, what are e-signatures? And uh, they can be a lot of different things, and people see them differently as well, and people talk about them differently, even though we use the same words. So I'm going to sort of start with the basics in some way, where there's actually a difference between digital and electronic signatures. So usually when you say e-signatures, it's electronic signatures. But there's a slight difference, maybe not important, but just as a foundation for this talk, I'm going to start there. And a digital signature is always relying on a crypto-based technology. I'm not going to go so much into the super techy stuff, because that's not really where, where I know my, most of my things, but simplified, it's about somehow enhancing information or a document or digital document with some kind of cryptographic information. Um, and in this case, 
somehow tied to a signature. And I'll go a little deeper into that later on. So this is the first sort of um, mind-jumping uh, thing, uh, just to get your, get your attention, kind of. So I'll, I'll read it for you. So an electronic signature is a collective noun. Therefore, a digital signature can be an electronic signature. But an electronic signature is not always a digital signature. And uh, if you don't uh, get all that, it's OK. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And by the end of this presentation, you hopefully understand what this means. So some aspects of e-signatures that could be important to actually understand, and, and the reasons why we actually use e-signatures. So the first one is authenticity. So is a signature uniquely linked to the signatory? In the sense that I can sign something, uh, but if I'm using um, what's very common today, just an image of my name, is that really uniquely linked to me? Or is it just an image that I've actually sent to someone else and they have signed the document with that image. The second thing is identity. Can we be absolutely sure we can identify the signatory? So maybe I claim to be Stefan when I sign something, but maybe I'm actually Tamas. I mean, yesterday was a little confusing. So. The third thing, authentication. Can we be 100% confident that the signature is created under the sole control of the signatory? So maybe I'm just signing by getting something sent to my email with a link. I just click the link, and that signs a document or something. But maybe Aniko has hacked my email. And she's actually sending an, an email to me, but it's, she's the one clicking the link. So can we be 100% sure that it's actually me that signs the document? And the last part is integrity. So can we detect any changes in the document after it's signed? And this is where the, cryptogra the cryptography comes in, and it's very handy. So basically, we can add information to the document uh, saying that it consists of a certain state at this moment. If someone would later change the document, that will be traceable if you use the cryptography. So basically, if, if all these four aspects uh, both are needed and are actually fulfilled, that's usually what we call a digital signature. If maybe one or none of these aspects are fulfilled, or maybe they're not needed. That could be the case as well. Uh, that's usually when we uh, use sort of, when we talk about electronic signatures. And now we're doing some disco things here because we made some uh, initial changes this morning. Anyway, how, why and how do we actually use e-signatures? It's all about trust. As long as we trust something, we don't really need uh, necessarily any way of knowing who, is, who has done what, who's doing what, who did what. Uh, we simply trust that all is good, all is fine. And where we have been and where we are in many cases in the world still is we, we still do face-to-face -face agreements. We have handwritten signatures on paper. And we're fairly, at least I would say, most of us are fairly familiar with the building trust in physical presence. We can see the person, we can feel their body language, we can sort of be part of a dialogue. Uh, and that trust helps us to agree on things. The more digitalized we become, the more anonymous our meetings become as well. So we're, we're creating agreements with people that maybe we've never even met. Maybe, maybe we will never even ever meet them. So 
that becomes a little more challenging to build trust when you don't know the person, you've never met the person. And that is one of the things that uh, the Erasmus Without Paper network has sort of started building. Uh, It's a network of applications uh, and or rather, I'll just do like this. So, this the, the one way of looking at it is it's a set of applications that are interconnected and where information is transferred between organizations and individuals. And agreements are made by, and this might sound a little condescending maybe, but it, I'm sort of making a point there, pushing buttons and storing the results in databases. And to be honest, this is usually the way we do things. We an agreement is someone logging into a system, pushing an OK button, and that saves somewhere a one or a zero in the database saying that, OK, this has been agreed by a certain individual that had at least the possibility of, of identifying themselves by logging into a system. Or another example is that when you get these famous miles long texts of do you agree with the conditions and you press yes, but no one really usually need, reads them. So just pushing buttons is still a very common way of uh, actually agreeing to something. But the, the, the problem here is the more complex ecosystem we create, the more likely someone will circumvent expected procedures, which can erode the trust. It can be both that, yeah, as I said, Allah, every, everyone push, pushes yes on the button that they've agreed to read all the fine details, but people maybe don't do it. Or another example is then if you create too complex uh, requirements for passwords for users, a lot of them just decide on one and then they keep that for everything because it's too complicated to come up with several. Or the bigger complexity we build into systems, the harder it is to keep it, keep track of everything. And as long as that works, which it usually does, at least in the beginning, it's fine. But at some point there can be instances where something happens that we haven't thought about. And then maybe we see that people have started to agree on things where it actually wasn't that person that agreed on it. Or later they come back saying that, no, I didn't agree on this at all. So then we might want to have some kind of traceability, some kind of way of acquiring accountability as well. And this is where e-signatures can help. So it's one way of enabling the things I talked about earlier, authenticity, identification, authentication, and integrity in a system, which also increases trust. However, again, this also adds to the complexity of the systems. So this is where, why it's important to also have a balance, at least I find it, that um, some systems maybe don't use need the the e-signatures, and and that's fine. Then it shouldn't be added. Otherwise, other systems may be super critical. So there's there's usually a balance in in, in this sort of complexity. And then I wanted to dig a little deeper into sort of the trust in e-identities that we're using today, and the different frameworks that we are actually using to create this trust. In our community, there are a couple of different ones. So one is the Edugain Identity Federation. And uh, maybe I can get a, a raise of hands. How many are part of the Edugain that you know of, have a university account or something like that? Yeah? Quite a few of us. So <clears throat> this has been, at least in my mind, a an, an super good way of building trust. I mean, every organization, or usually universities or research uh, organizations, they have, they take care about their own users, so to speak. They ensure that their identities are um, maintained in a good way. But we still federate them, we connect them together so that one institution can use services that another institution has, and I mean, one of the greatest examples of this is uh, Eduroam that we, many of us can use today. 
I just come to Venice and, and I have Wi-Fi. I don't have to do anything because there's already trust there. There's already a trust that even though I come from Stockholm here for the first time, someone here trusts that it's okay for me to use the wireless network. And that trust shouldn't be taken for granted. It's uh, something we built over a lot of years and it's also important to maintain that trust. So something that has become, I would say, more, more increasingly uh, worked on the last couple of years is the assurance level of the users within this network. And with assurance we mean how sure can we actually be that a specific account is connected to the individual that claims to have this account. So one of the things used in, in Edugain, and there are different ones, but I'm not going to be able to uh, go into all of them, but I'll use this as an, as an example, is the Refed Assurance Network or framework. So basically, there are three levels of assurance in uh, this framework. There's a low assurance, which is, and this is an example, it's not the only one, but it can be a self-asserted identity together with a verified email address. Basically, that usually means that you send uh, an email or a verification to some email address where someone clicks on a link. So basically, you usually know that this is a person rather than a, a bot or an AI or whatever. The second level is medium, where a person, and again, this is an, uh, just an example, a person has sent a copy of the government-issued photo ID to the credential service provider, and the credential service provider has had a remote live video conversation with them. So basically, here we take, another, take it another step. We're not just sure that, that or we don't, it's not just that we can be fairly sure it's a human, we are also fairly sure which human and individual this is. And then we have the, high, the, the last um, level, which is high. And uh, that could be that a person has presented an identity document, document that is checked to be genuine and represent the claimed identity and steps have been taken to minimize the risk of a lost, stolen, suspended, revoked, or expired document. So at this level, we are very sure that it's a human. We are very sure who this human is. And we've also taken steps to ensure that the credential used to prove who this human is is still valid. So there's a time aspect usually in, in this as well. And <clears throat> That's the trust, that was the trust framework used in, in, uh, in, in, in Edugain. Then I, I want to spend a few uh, minutes or a few seconds at least on uh, another kind of trust network that we're using in, in all of Europe, sort of outside our sector. And th this I would say, I'm very proud of working in, in the university sector. We've come a long way and what other sectors and, and sort of countries, and in this case Europe is trying to do, we've been doing for a long time. So that's, that's quite nice to see. But anyway, EIDAS, it's a regulation on electronic identification and trust services. So basically it's about, in one hand, creating this identity federation that within academic sector we already have, but EU wants to create it on a national level. And then, uh, by the way, this regulation is already in place. Uh, in my mind, it's not super successful yet, but I'm not gonna go into that. Then we're also building trust services to be used with these electronic identities. So it's basically not just mo mobility for students, it's mobility for individuals within the European Union. So basically, they're just copying Erasmus without papers, but yeah, trying to at least. Um, so 
What I wanted to, to highlight in uh, EIDAS is uh, something that is that's sort of interesting from the point of specifically e-signatures, which is one of the trusted services. And there are three levels or three types of signatures in EIDAS. One is uh, called simple. Basically, that is what we talked initially about, the electronic signatures. It can be anything. It can be someone has uh, an, uh, just an image saying, this is me. Or they sort of digitally write something, and, and that ends up in, in the document. So it can be pretty much anything. The next type is called advanced. And this has more or needs more features to actually be defined as advanced. So basically it needs, it has, it is uniquely linked to the signatory. It is capable of identifying the signatory. It is created using electronic signature creation data that a signatory can, with a high level of confidence, use under its sole control. And it is linked to the data signed there with, signed there with, in such a way that any subsequent change in the data is detectable. So maybe this sounds familiar. These were the four points I talked about early on. So basically, if all these four points are achieved and you can do all these things, then you have an advanced signature, according to EIDAS. The thing is that anyone can do this. Anyone can claim to do this. And it might be true, it might not be true, that they actually fulfill these needs. That is, from the advanced point of view, it's, it's up to the receiver, so to speak, or the relying party to actually evaluate and say, is this true? If you have the, the highest type or the last type in EADAS, which is called qualified, your service that is actually sort of creating this signature is then audited according to EADAS regulation. So there's an uh, external party that have actually gone through your um, the, the signature service and then it becomes a qualified trust service. And then you're also using certificates that can be traceable in the sense that if I sign a document with a qualified signature, I send it to you, you are then able to use open uh, software to actually validate that this signature is indeed correct. So that was sort of my initial uh, way of opening up the world of, of e-signatures a little, to, to get you uh, a little knowledge about, about it. And my point with these questions that will come is to get some kind of feeling in the room what is actually used here. But also, some of these questions you might be able to answer today. Some of these questions you might not be, answer, be able to answer today. But hopefully after my presentation, you can go out in the world, or at least home to your home organization, and, and, and look at things in a new light and see, what are we actually doing here? Do we need e-signatures? Do we not need e-signatures? And then the things you can't tell me today, you can tell me at a later point. So you can just send me an email saying, hey, Stefan, I didn't really understand everything or didn't really know how we were doing things back home when I was sitting here in Venice, but now I know. And now I know both how we do it and what we want, so then you can tell me. Or maybe you can send me an email saying, hey, Stefan, I listened to this talk about e-signatures. I don't know if it's really the way to go. I mean, you should maybe change profession or do something more useful with your life. So, 19 people have answered, most yes, and some no. Um, I actually wanted to try to open up. Is there someone that would like to say a few words about yes, what you're actually using? Thank you. 
Please raise your hand if you want to talk. Want to say something? Okay. When ahorita you should say something. So Stefan, we we are using government uh, produce uh, certificates or even the e-card, the the mm -hmm. physical cards, depending on what you want to use, because we have the infrastructure to use them. We can use them for authenticating to enter the system. So the IDP can use uh, certificates for identifying. Yeah. No need to use a password. You can authenticate with your certificate or your government card, the, the national ID card. And we also use it for document flow. Mm -hmm. So if you have to see in a document, you receive an, an email, you go to a part of, of the infrastructure, see the document you are signing, you click and you sign, or you can even sign documents, a PDF that you want to sign, you get it, sign it, and, and send it. So we are using it in all that pieces to verify many things, or sign the, the marks for the students, or for a purchase order, or contracts, or even for MOUs between uh, institutions, we are using uh, the e-signatures. E Thank so, you. Now, someone else. Okay. Thank you. Gracias. Who was it? Mr. Ferreira. Hello. Um, in, in Portugal, the, the country I'm coming from, we have, uh, all the citizens have um, a digital signature, so they can sign documents, uh, PDF documents. Um, we also, at my university, we are using qualified signatures. So signatures that state that you are belong that you sign as someone from that organization and not as a citizen, and we are signing also a lot of documents, uh, certificates, transcripts, and so on, digitally. That's what we do. Thank you. Okay, so I'll move on to the next question now. So how high assurance is your organization's e-identity? So this, I expect this to be a tough one, but we'll see. So basically the assurance was sort of how sure are you or are your organization that you're actually um, the person that you claim to be? Okay. Some medium, some high, I'm impressed. No low? Oh, this, sound, this looks too good to be true, really. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's good, that's good. Okay, cool. So there's a tie between high and not sure. We need a winner. Anyone else? Do we have number 20? No? Okay, it's a tie. It's a tie between high and not sure. So I'm going to be... Uh, no, actually, I see I'm, I'm talking a little too much. So I'm going to go on to the next question here. How high assurance is demanded when doing an e-signature? And I realize now, as I read this question, it might be a little ambiguous. But let's let's take it from um, uh, an Erasmus without paper cons uh, perspective. So, if there would be an e-signature uh, working with the, the within the Erasmus project, how high assurance would you say? that would demand. So a lot of medium, a lot of high. And I would say something to, to have in mind also that currently uh, I would say most of the assurance is low because it's usually a login to the system. 
So what I read from this is that there's actually, there would be some uh, perspectives that feel there would be reasonable to sort of increase the assurance in the network at the moment. Okay, so people are uh, okay with the way there is as well. So I like this. It's, it can be sort of, a, I like the, the live things happening here. But still, medium seems to be the majority in this case. And, and incidentally, just looking at Sweden, uh, if, we, if our identity federation in Sweden is called Svamid, and uh, the majority of IDPs in our federation is, has a medium assurance level. So I think that's, that's fairly, very, or very reasonable level of assurance for an, uh, for an identity federation. Okay, so, and this is my last question for now, I think. So what type of e-signature is used? And this, again, is a little ambiguous, but let's go with sort of within your um, organization. So if you use, for those that use e-signatures in your organization, if you know what type of signature. Is it uh, just a simple image in a document? Is it some kind of cryptographical solution where you can actually validate it later on, which is advanced? Or is it actually a qualified, from a qualified trust service provider? And again, this qualified, I'm impressed. There's a lot of security in this room. A lot of work has gone into uh, making uh, our digital world safe. The, this time is EI that's to the rescue because any government provided signature is a qualified one. So now that Euro is getting lots of government provided e-signatures, it's easy to be in the qualified level. Yes. Thanks to EIDAS, yes. which I don't, uh, you know me. <laughs> you, you, still, you still have to go through certain hoops to become qualified trust service providers. So not all governments have uh, qualified trust service providers yet, but we're getting there. So that's, that's really good. Okay, I think this was the questions from yesterday, the Q&A. I'll leave the, the big Q&A for, for once I'm actually finished. So, how about e-signatures in uh, the project we're here to talk about? So basically, there are two ways of looking at this that I wanted to, to highlight for you today. Uh, and one is uh, the components of EduSign, the EduSign signature service. So basically, in, in, Net, in Sweden, we have built an open source signature solution. And uh, this open source signature solution was the, what we actually brought into the project, saying, hey, we, we have a signature solution. Maybe we should uh, try out to see how we can connect this to Erasmus without paper and see what we can do about it. So the current uh, production version that we're running in, in Sweden, it has three parts. There's a front end, which is a graphical user interface. I'll show some picture, pictures later. Uh, that's actually what the user interacts with. It's in a web browser. They just log in somewhere, and then they, they do stuff. Uh, and then we have the signature service backend, which handles the actual signing and all the cryptographic things with all the certificates. And then we have separate, so the front end and the back end is connected through an API, and then we have a, a, a separate part that is the validation service. So this is where, I mean, this is kind of the whole thing of having a digital uh, sign signature that once you, you've signed something, you want to be able to actually check it. So basically I sign something, I send it to someone, then they will, they, at least there should be a validation service that it, this user can for example, upload a document to see that it has been signed, it hasn't been changed, and whatever. 
So I'll show a, a picture of how that looks as well. So that's sort of one way of uh, using signatures. There's something sort of standalone, so to speak. The other perspective is what we're actually doing in, in the EDSSI projects. So basically we're integrating the signature uh, in an already existing flow within, uh, I should probably say, the ED, uh, Erasmus without paper here instead of EDSSI, but anyway, I'll see it from the pro project perspective. So this part has four uh, perspectives. One is my academic idea that, ID that we've talked about. So basically that's used for identity linking or logging into something just to ensure that it's, uh, we have the information we need about the person that is sort of entering the system. And then we have been uh, using the OLA portal, online learning agreements, which is an application which can be any application, but we're using the online learning agreement portal as an example now. So basically we take that and then we connect that application to the signature service backend, which is EduSign in this case, with the APIs. So from the user point of view, they're always going to be in the online learning agreement, but behind the scenes there's a signature service that signs the information that is processed in the OLA portal. And then we have Harika uh, in, in Greece that acts as our CA or certificate authority. So they are the ones that are handling the qualified certificates to generate the signatures that is then showed in the OLA portal. So I'll briefly just sort of show you just it's usually images makes things a little easier to understand. So basically this is what a user face when they log into EduSign. They access through seamless access it's called. It's basically a discovery service of all of EduGain. So they can log in, they search for their organization, they upload a document and uh, this is in, I don't know how this is in other countries, but in Sweden governments have uh, uh, a requirement of sort of tracking all documents that actually are received by the governments, but we didn't want to be, have to track everything that people sign. So we're actually, most of the stuff happens in the user's browser. It's only when they actually sign things that the document is sent somewhere, and then we see it, it's sent for processing rather than uh, arriving at the government. So the user uploads a document into the browser. They, they have to preview and approve it, and this is part of the sort of trust creation. Uh, what actually happens is that when they press the preview and approve, they get up an, uh, a, a, an image of the document that they have to click, I've, this is the correct document, just to indicate someone would sort of get into to a dispute. Uh, we could say that, well, you actually did look at the document. So you should at least be aware that it's the right one. And then once you've previewed and approved, you can sign it. And this is the stage where the document is actually sent to the signature service backend and then, then back. Um, and there, of course, there's a lot of other features. I mean, the, usually you don't sign documents yourself. You actually want someone else to sign it. So you can invite people to sign your documents and they log into the system and sign it and, and all that stuff. That's one, oh, okay. There was one last slide. You can download the document, that's good. Uh, then the, the second part I want to show is the actual validation service. So the signature service you have to authenticate or log in to actually use. The validation service is totally public because anyone that has one of these documents should be able to validate it. So basically anyone can go to the validation service and uh, realize now maybe I should put links to, to all these so you can actually try it yourself. I'll, I'll maybe do that at some point later. Maybe we can send out something. I don't know. Anyway, these, these are public, so I mean, already now on actually edusign.sunet.se, you should be able to log in yourself and see how it looks. 
Um, you need uh, an agreement with Suna to be able to upload and sign. Though. So anyway, when you validate the document, this is how it looks. Uh, you can see the signature is valid. It's a signature validation. You can, uh, there's, there's a time span where, and this is a slightly tricky part for, for uh, I've noticed, for, for people to understand the difference, and, and I think we can be more clear in, in, in our communication with users, that these signatures and certificates have a time um, frame where they're valid. The same way that your driver license and your passport, it expires at some point. Um, that doesn't mean that what, when you sign something manually, if your passport expires, that doesn't make that your signature is not valid anymore. But it's maybe the, the actual document that you, need, that you use to compare your signature is not valid. And that's similar in this case for the, for the, the certificates. So there's, they expire, so at some point you can't validate the signature but the signature itself can still be valid in the context of the legal binding to the document. And then you see a lot of other information here as well. Uh, I mean, which identity provider did you use? Which service provider did you use? Um, yeah, little information about me that signed this. And here's an example of uh, a signed OLA document. And I should say, all of this is sort of proof of concept at the moment. Um, we'll see how far we get into the, the project, but I expect that by the end of the project we will have a proof of concept saying this is what we can do, and then it will be up to, well, all you guys and also the possible continuation of this kind of project to, to, to decide what do we actually want to implement in the production Erasmus Without Papers. So here you can see on the left side, you have uh, the, what I would call the simple signatures. It's, it's just sort of some, and this is bogus data, but it's just some kind of images saying that, okay, someone has signed it. On the right side, you have the signature page that is added by EduSign. And again, this is a common misunderstanding that the signature page is actually the signature. But that's not true. It's just a graphical representation of the signature. The actual signature is the cryptographical information that is added to the document. So some people, they print these documents, then they scan them, and then they send them on and say, okay, here's my signed document. But that's, you've sort of destroyed the actual signature then. So be mindful. Um, I'm, I'm running out a little on time, so I'll, I'll go through these quickly. Other topics that we've explored in uh, the L2 um, project is uh, e-translation. Basically, how can we automate translation of documents in, in the Raspus project? E-archiving, my, my colleague Fran will talk about that soon. We're also building a student housing application. So basically, we're doing a pro proof of concept where we're um, building a mock of a student housing organization that students should, through the Erasmus World Paper Network or program, be able to sort of sign up and sign off for student housing already from home. So this is uh, just as we're integrating the OLA um, portal with e-signature, we're doing a, a proof of concept of integrating a student housing application with e-signature. So, the last questions for today. Um, maybe I have a slide on this, yes. What documents would you like digitally signed in the Erasmus program? So we have online learning agreements, and I'm, 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 I believe it's called inter-institutional agreements, right? Yeah. And then other. And I'm happy there's already some other because those are the ones I'm interested in. So 
I think there's a few minutes left, and I'll, I'll use that to actually ask the ones that asked, answered other. Anyone want to elaborate on that? Maybe, sorry? Trans transcripts of records. Yeah. Transcripts of records. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? I think there are more people that answered other. I, I think I'm the, the elder in the room because I've been in Erasmus without paper since it didn't was uh, named uh, Erasmus without paper. Mm. And there was someone from, from Porto University, Luis Valente and I, that were in every, each and every discussion, we said that every, everything that is exchanged should be signed mm. properly. So you cannot change anything on the move. Now it's encrypted in the tunnel, yeah, but the payload, what we are moving, should be signed yeah. and encrypted. So that was our opinion since the start. So I answered other yeah. as well. <laughs> Thank you. Last, I think we have time for one more other. If there's anyone that answered other. Okay, so my closing words here today will be that the way I see it today, we've gone from having physical papers that we sign by hand, we've gone to digital papers or PDFs usually that we sign digitally. And as I see, we talked a lot about wallets yesterday, or there was a lot of talk about wallets. And the way I see it, the next step in this sort of e-signature uh, ecosystem will be that we sign information in flow, just as we, you mentioned. So basically, I think there will be an ecosystem of e-signatures where maybe not everything, but all, all important information that is uh, agreed on or, or sent on is signed at that moment, either by individuals or by organizations. And uh, uh, if uh, anyone has more questions about this or maybe the EU digital identity wallets, you can uh, come up to me in a break and, and we can talk, discuss more about it. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Stefan. And now, uh, now our next speaker is Ferran. Would you come closer, please? From uh, the University of Barcelona, Ferran will discuss the proof of concept of the CEF e archiving building block from both the, the, the SSI and <coughs> Erasmus Plus perspective. Please, it's a, your floor. Sorry, I'm just going to jump in for a second here. I, I realized I said uh, that I wanted you to email me, but I didn't give you my email. So, um, how do I add a slide here? I'll just do like this. So if you want to reach me uh, with questions or feedback on your organization, you can please send me an email at steely at sonet.se. I'm just going to unplug this.
Grazie Gian Salvo, uh, thank you Stefan, I'm my leader of activity two. So let me just, because I had to switch computers, this is, um, in here, thank you. I just take the time here. Yeah. Well, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, thank you, everyone. In the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce task 2.3, and uh, I will explain the. See, for say, Stefan, it's a little bit taller than me. And um, well, I'm going to explain its goals. And if I do not run out of time, I would like to make a, a live demonstrations. Although I've got the slides just in case, because you know it's quite risky sometimes doing live demonstrations, I will try to do, to do so. So we, we, will, we will try, we'll do our best. Um, uh, Stefan, talk about integrity. Integrity in digital signatures. It's like we sign something, we close it, just like in a lock, and we can warranty no one's just uh, touch anything in that document for a period of time. Okay, what happens when that period of time ends? We are testing a CF e-archive building block, which has a lot of features, but we also want to test it to check if we can use it to keep integrity of uh, digital signed documents. So CEF, the archiving building block, and EDSSI2 -E projects are linked um, in order to check this integrity feature, but also for the rest of the documents that maybe are not digitally signed and are within a folder, we should have a solution at the very end of the process in order to keep this information for the retention period we chose to. So before starting my... Uh, presentation just let me sorry just let me play a one minute video again one minute video because it summarizes very well how how um, C C F the archive building block it's explained and then I, I will move on I will skip the Every day, data is being produced in many different types, sizes, and formats. So how do we keep this growing amount of data safe and easy to access? At first, we used this. It was awesome 30 years ago. But can you imagine how storage will be like 30 years from now? Or what about 300 years from now? What will happen to data if we don't find a way to keep it alive? Medical records, business information, and even our most precious memories will be lost. E-archiving is a building block designed to prevent just that. It's a universal set of standards and specifications for preserving, describing, and transmitting digital data. It can help anyone who's responsible for storing data safely because it ensures that different types of institutions and communities can file and access data the very same way across borders, and that sensitive information is handled according to legal requirements. E-archiving gives you the superpower to package information and keep it accessible, easily identifiable, and reusable for years to come. Pick up a building block and let's connect Europe together. Okay, so this is the advertising part. Let's go to, um, to the specifics. I'm back here. Okay, here we are. So it's not only about digital signed documents, but all kinds of documents, records, and data. Because we are moving from the classic record manager and um, institutions based to probably data managed institution based. So according to, to CEF, what's e-archiving? Let me just read. Important information should be kept accessible and reusable for the years to come, regardless of the system used to store it. E-archiving provides core specifications, software, training, and knowledge to help people preserve and reuse information over the long term. E-archiving is about long-term preservation. It's also about uh, format long-term term preservation. Well, what will, will happen to PDF files 
in 20 years' time. We'll, we will be using a PDF format, will be another format, and e-archiving states that can move from one format to another. We, will, we want to check that. So e-archiving and EDSSI2 project. One of the main goals of, e, of the EDSSI project is the signature, as we just already heard. And the service is already running, and you can test it, as Stefan just showed us. And uh, the, the main thing is that we wanted to check it on the online learning agreement portal. Can we link both things? How can we link them? We link them manually. We link them uh, using web services. Uh, we will link them at all. We'll see. So in order to make a proof of concept, we took the online learning agreement, uh, the OLA, OLA. And why OLA? Just because it has important information. Remember, we, I save it. Keep it here. So the online learning agreement has important information, and it is a digitally signed document. We want to push there. We want to know if we can keep integrity. Remember, Stefan talked about authenticity, reliability. Remember the last point, it was integrity. Can we be sure that the information is in within the document will be the same in the years to come? Maybe archive building block help us to achieve that. So task 2.3 is within activity 2. It started on uh, September 2020, month 13, and it will last until um, August 2023, month uh, 23. That's it. We divided the project into three phases. We started with a prototyping phase, then we moved to a proof of concept phase. It's the one we are just right now. And then we will, um, there will be an outcome that will be a report based on our findings. So more in, more in detail, what, did, what we did so far. First off, we wanted to understand what the CEFE archive building block is. Then, as I said, actually use it and check it its viability for the project. There are four questions here, but we've got a, a lot more. But um, can we use it to warranty long-term preservation of documents? Can we move from one format to another? Can we keep integrity, as I said, for digital signed documents? Then how we use it on higher education institutions, how we actually use it, and can we automate uh, the solution? Does the solution have has web services, or we have to do all that manually? Then finally report our, our findings. So first phase was from month 13 to more than month 16. We started gathering information. Uh, we found out that the, the the archive building block is based on the outcomes of the eARC project that uh, lasted from 2014 to 2017. <laughs> it will crash eventually. And that piloted to an end to end OAS compliant eArchival services. We will, we will see what's an OAS eArchival compliant services. The Open Archival Information System is an archive system described on, on the Magenta book of the CSDS, the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, and eventually it became an international standard. That international standard is the one that the CEF the Archive Building Block is using for the project. I'm not going to, into details of, uh, on OA system, but basically it has three packages to work. The first package is the SIP package. It's the submission information package that contains all the necessary information to ingest the documents, the records, within its metadata into the system. If everything is done properly, then the system generates an archival information package. All things we can do into the system is made on the archival information package. Here we should keep integrity. We should move formats from one to another. We, sh we can also apply um, disposal policies, retention policies. We will see that later on. Lastly, we've got the dissemination information packages. When you want to just retrie retrieve information, when you want to um, retrieve information, 
uh, you get a DAP, and the DAP comes with the information you send on the SIP, and also a digitally signed that guarantees that nothing happened within the system. This is why we want to use that. We are just checking if that will be uh, enough to maintain integrity of the documents within the, uh, within the system, sorry. Okay, we contacted the CEFE archiving project managers. We received a very useful additional information and they guided, guided us to up-to-date information. The CEFE website is no longer up-to-date. They are just waiting for fundings in order to keep it running. So the information is not in the, in the internet. They've got the information for themselves, but they point, pointed us to the last updated information. Then they also pointed us to Roda Solution. That it's the one we are just using, using to, to complete the project. Here you've got the repositories in order if you want to check um, all the documents and files that are stored there. So, Roda. We come to Roda. After we gather the information, after we learn a little bit more about an OI system, we learn a little bit more about Roda. Roda is a ready-made solution. Just remember the CEF archive building block are specifications for everyone to use, open specifications, so you can make your own software, but they provide you a ready-made solution. It's just about plug and play solution. So here you've got the specifications, but the interesting part is that Roda is based on an open source technology. It complies with the UI system and complies with a lot of schemes of metadata, standards metadata, mainly METs, but also encoded archival description or tabling core. But Roda comes with Roda in, and this is a very useful tool because in order to send SIPs to the system, you have to actually made them. You have to comply with some requirements. Rodain is a tool that helps you to make that. You just select some folders and files, and then uh, Roda prepares you the SAP in order to send it to uh, Roda. So as you can read, you can create, load, and edit classification schemes. In case you did not that before into the system, you can automate associations of files, etc. I'm going forward because it's just 15 minutes left. Using Roda, let's go. Um, we started by using Roda with uh, Domingo, which we've got in, in, in the video. And we started the very first time with the demo version online. You've got a demo version available where you can just play a little bit, but information is not kept there. You can just upload information and the day afterwards you have to do the work again. So we said that's not the way we can just check all the functionalities, so we style it locally. We style it locally and could make a deeper, deeper test, but with limited availability. We should install Roda in every computer, so we ended up with a solution of installing it into an Athora cloud. In Athora cloud, we can just access from everywhere, and, and then we can uh, give permissions to everyone we need to. We found out some uh, issues because latest version of Roda, which is 4.0, and wasn't working on the Azure Cloud. This, we will report that on the report, on the final report. And so we just downgrade, don't downgrade it one version to I would think 3.7.1, I don't remember, but this uh, version works properly. Finally, we stole Roda in into the computer to make the test. Then comes the work of the archivist and the solution it's not only techy, but it's also for records managers and archivists that they have to prepare all the system in order to work. So archivists in Roda created the authority record, in that case, uh, University of Barcelona, and then just uploaded the file plan of the institution, created the collection, the series, and also defined the metadata schemes. We can, you can base those metadata scheme on MEDS, Dublin Core, or EAD. We use just Dublin Core for the testing purposes. And also, we created an OLA fake, a fake OLA in order to make the test. We made two fakes, unlike learning agreement um, 
fake documents, one digitally signed and one not signed, in order to see how the system responded. Then created this SAP and sent it into the system. Okay, at this point, I'm going with the slides. If I've got time, just make the live version. This is Roda. And you've got here the welcome, welcome menu. Uh, you have a login and some, and, uh, some features just to go ahead with the, with the program. Very, very quick. What do we have to do before using the system? First off, creating the entity, the authority record. We created the University of Barcelona. Just click on the bottom. Then you've got some metadata schemes. You fulfill all the fields you need to create your uh, entity and go ahead. Once you create your entity, there's the process archivist did in the previous slides, so remember, file plan, etc. When you've got all that, you can use Roda in order to select the folders and try to make the SAP into the system. So, this is uh, Roda in. Yes, you can see there are a couple of files into one folder. We selected it, we associated it into one metadata scheme, proceed with the creation of the SAP, you've got here very different choices. You can make an SAP from one folder, an SAP from each file. It will crash at the right end. Okay, we choose the first option, I selected the, the folder within the documents, created the SAP, and just run the process. Once everything was run and okay, created two um, zip uh, documents containing all the information. Here we were ready to go back to Roda and upload the SAP. This is Roda. We uploaded uh, the file. Once the transfer, the pre-transfer process was complete, was within the system, and then we can actually proceed to make the ingest to be, to move from SAP to an AIP. In the ingest process, there are a lot of features. You can check if uh, the, the package has viruses, for example. You can choose to move, to change formats. If you've got a GPG uh, document, maybe you can, or you want to move it to a uh, PNG format. In theory, the system allows you to do that. We have, uh, haven't checked that yet, but we will do some, some tests. Okay, you choose your your options, you select the entity, in that case, University of Barcelona, and pr proceed with the process. In everything, if, if everything works properly, you've got a done status, very nice green button, button. And after that, you can just search on the catalog for the results. Go to the University of Barcelona, arrive to the entity, you've got your serious level. Once you're in the serious level, you can check that there is actually a file within and once you um, enter the file, you can find all documents you send on the SIP. Okay, you can see, we, we also send an ODT in order to check how the system responded. It also has a PDF uh, built-in viewer for, for just PDF format. If you want to just check any of the documents, you have to download it and then open it with your, your software. Additional features not tested so far. Um, Roda and all OA systems has a preservation actions mod module. So you have a module that, as I said, can change formats or just check for viruses and run some management tasks. But also you've got a disposal module in records management. We don't have to keep all the information for forever, but sometimes you have to do that. So you have those choices. There are, in fact, three different choices. Keep everything forever, delete it at some point, let's review it in a further date. And then we've got a very interesting locks module to actually see all that happened within the system. We think we, ma we might also use that in order to keep uh, a warranty integrity of the documents in the system. This is the uh, lock uh, module. This is the, the preservation actions module with the different choices. 10 minutes left. And we've got the retention uh, and the disposal module where we can just apply a retention permanently and review at the end of our retention period or destroy at the end of our retention period. So conclusion so far before we go to the live mode. 
No need to, no software needs to be created to use the CEFE archive building block. Roda is a plug and play solution. It's a real solution for long-term preservation purposes, documents, and records. Probably we are in an era that are moving from actual records to data, just data, XML um, documents. We should um, have some way to keep that information reliable for the long term. Is an international standard compliant, may be used to guarantee uh, outdated digital signed documents. We want to check that. And this is a, a con in, in, in our view. It's a manual solution. No web services found so far. So we cannot actually connect uh, the OLA portal to RODA. Um, we will keep looking information uh, about that. So next steps, uh, make a test with a real online learning agreement, test preservation functionalities and actions, and test disposal functionalities and policies. And at the very end, just proceed with the SI2 task report project. So thank you, but I'm not finishing here. I've got at least eight minutes left, and I'm going to test. If you have questions, you can do them now while I'm just running the logouts and logins into the system. Okay, this is Roda on the Azure Cloud. I'm just connecting into the cloud right now and I'm going to open uh, Roda in, which is downloaded locally and it should be pretty Fast forward, okay, I made a demo folder here. As you can check, I, I ran some tests yesterday. Uh, okay, let's check this one. So you select a folder, upload it into the system, then you have to create a metadata scheme, and you have to associate the metadata scheme. Let's do something quick. Um, okay, that's it. I have to associate one. I'm going to do a method scheme for the whole file. I'm going to check in Dublin Core, not uh, EID. Okay, I confirm. Then we've got the pre method scheme. I'm just going to leave it everything like that, but you can add additional information just like when you created, who created it. Okay, that's okay, let's just run it, and if everything works properly, I just create a SIP. It asks me where I want to keep. Let's put it in here. Okay, start. So we've got the SIP. In here, you've got just an inventory report, the SIP, and the documents and records we wanted to make that, that SIP. With that done, we go back to Roda, and then we proceed with a transfer. Create a new process, choose files. I'm looking for this file. I just uploaded it, okay. Yeah, I cannot do that that many times. Let me <coughs> just try again. That should be the one, isn't it? Or maybe this one. Maybe it's this one. Okay, yeah. So we've got it uploaded. Let's done, we've got it in here. Today is 10, we select the SIP and just proceed with the process. Here we've, we've got a lot of features. We, I'm just uh, check the, I, the virus checking because it takes quite a long time. Select the entity and that's it, let's Let's just start the process. It takes about 30 seconds or so.
So here it's just checking the meds metadata is uh, just fulfilled properly. If it uh, fits all the standards, then you've got a message. If it's uh, green, it's perfect. And then you can look into the catalog and actually check for the documents and records. As you can see, the one from today is the last one. I can go through the item, check its metadata, just the ones I just fulfilled, fulfilled a few seconds ago, and actually go to the documents I uploaded. Okay. So that's it, that's Roda. I think I'm on time, three minutes. If you've got any questions, queries, I don't know if it's slide or, yep. Thank you, Aniko. You're in here. So in Rodas, it's possible to add more than one document at the same time. Yeah, we, we just saw that in bulk. Yeah, we can do that as well. International offices usually deal with hundreds of documents. Yeah, no problem, as you can, as you already check on the demonstration. No more questions in here. Any question, something you want to know? So if no questions, thank you very much. Thank you. All welcome back to our last session of the EDSSI Level 2U EU Student ECAD Stakeholders Forum. Our next speaker will be Jeroen van Lent. No, is this right pronunciation? No? no? Is it a right pronunciation? Jeroen, sorry who will still share with you the details and the aims of the European Student Card, simplifying student mobility for students and higher education institutions. Like before, if you have some questions, you, you can use a slide or raise your hands. Please, the, the floor is yours. I want to see if this works, because I feel I'm too tall to stand on that, on that stage. Huh? Like, it would just make me feel like a, like a giant. Good. So I hope you enjoyed the coffee break. Um, it's this button. Yeah, it's always <laughs> good to check. So my name is, uh, is Jeroen. Don't worry about the name. It's difficult. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm used to this. Um, I work for Entity Data. Uh, as was briefly introduced yesterday, we are the contractor that is implementing the European Student Card in the European Student Card Initiative. Um, I will try to provide you with a little bit more details on, on how all of that works and you know what it is that we are exactly doing. Um, and within that team, I am the IT project manager, so I coordinate all the technical work that we carry out, um, work with the various technical stakeholders, and I'm also happy to listen to you. And I've already listened to all the things that were discussed in the past days as well um, to make this even better, right? So the topic is the European Student Card, simplifying student mobility for students in higher education institutions. Let's see if we can do that. Huh? Um, so yes, one important thing to mention as well is that we are uh, an IT consultancy company. Uh, Entity Data is doing projects in all kinds of different fields. You may know them from your countries. Specifically here, we are carrying out this project on behalf of the European Commission. So everything that I'm saying here is also on behalf of DG AAC. This has all been cleared with them. Um, it's the initiative that we're presenting. So um, to start off, the objective of today is not so technical. So I'm sorry for those of you that like technical details. <laughs> I'm also sorry for some of you that may have already heard some of this. I actually realized yesterday that we have a great deal of people in the room that contributed to the early stages of the European Student Card, um, meaning that you will probably know better than me. <laughs> but I will try to summarize. Eh? <laughs> exactly. Um, try to summarize, give a bit of a historical perspective, um, then or look at what we have been doing so far, and also what's ahead. Um, by the way, if the microphone is doing weird stuff, please wave and I will move to this one, eh? because I heard yesterday sometimes it cut out, and I don't think you can hear it when I'm standing here. <laughs> okay, so jumping right back in, uh, what's the European student card, and what are fits? Well, I, I think I don't have to explain you this, we've been talking about student cards for the last two days now, um, but for us the definition is really 
to make life easier for the three different parties involved. Um, on the one hand, to focus on students, give them access to on and off campus services by affirming this student status that they have. And then primarily within Erasmus Plus countries. Of course, this thing can be used globally. We are keeping in mind that it should be not restricted to the borders of Europe. But for now, the main focus that we have in mind is Erasmus Plus and a mobility. So someone going from one institution to another. Um, then the card issuers, in most cases universities, sometimes student unions and so on, um, that we want to avoid the need to issue a new student card for visiting students. And now we have had this discussion in the past as well with some of you. This may be very easy to do in some of your institutions. It may be very easy to issue a new student card when a student comes. But the vision here is really that people will go abroad more and more. There's more different types of mobilities, shorter term mobilities, just one course, European University Alliances that we heard of. And it's kind of essential that these people can access the services without the need to get a new student card. Of course, for a six months mobility, you may still give them one because it has certain advantages. But especially for these use cases of one course or you know, a two or three week mobility period, it is much easier to, to not have to do that, right? Um, and also for student service providers to, to streamline this verification process. So most importantly, that they have an idea how to validate cards, that they understand what to do with this card beyond just looking at it. Um, traditionally, within universities, service providers do validate it, but if we go to a bookshop or a museum or something like that, it's just a visual, visual inspection. And many people have gotten annoyed at me. Eh? They said, like, look, but I'm still using my student from years ago, and they still accept it to give me a discount. But that's kind of what we don't want, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so a bit of the history and, and also the policy side of it. Eh? It's, a, it's a presentation also on behalf of the commission, so it's a very important initiative for them. Um, and we're starting back in 2012, where many people in the room, I think, were together <laughs> um, in trying to, uh, trying to start this thing off. Um, there was sort of this first idea to send some, uh, some exchanges within the European Council for Student Affairs, right? Um, and to sign this MOU with four different countries to, to really try and start off this first European student card. Um, from 2016 to 2018, there was a very well-known pilot project, the Erasmus Plus project, the European student card, that sort of developed all the things that we have been basing ourselves on until today that sort of evolved into the various terms we've been hearing, right? So there's been um, EDSSI afterwards, EDSSI L2, now we're talking about the European Student Card Initiative, but they're all different steps in the timeline in a way. Um, so yes, building this, right? Now there is a project going on from 2021 to 2024, which is the moving of all of this to the Commission. And the big difference is, is that this is not an Erasmus Plus project anymore. This is not a key action tool where we get, you know, a few hundred thousand euros. No, this is a project where the Commission has, you know, significantly backed uh, with a large sum of money to really move these tools to their realm, to make them Commission tools, to make them universal, to make them standard. So this is also, you know, aiming to once and for all settle the confusion with all the different projects that we have and sort of gather everything, all the outcomes from the European Student Card, from EDSSI level two, from My Academic ID, um, and so on, and, and take this on. And there is another side of this initiative. Huh? So we are now focusing on the, on the European Student Card, but this is also where the continuation of Erasmus Without Paper is being carried out by, by other colleagues. Um, so yeah, this started in, uh, in November 2021. It's still ongoing, so we have been sort of working on this for, well, we've kind of been not working on it for a year now, because it says here November 2021, but the first work actually started in January 2022, meaning that we have around a year of work behind us. Um, a good amount of time ahead of us as well, though. Um, the aim of all of this is by 2025 to have this full deployment of the European Student Card, to have this accepted in most of the universities, to have a common understanding of how this thing works, um, and then really start, you know, having the benefit for, for students. Now, this all fits within the bigger European Student Card initiative, and this slide is there to provide a little bit of clarity. I think some of 
heard or all of you have heard about the European Student Card Initiative, but this word is a bit confusing because it's a lot more than just a student card. Huh? It's really all the processes that make this you know, Erasmus mobility green, that avoid the paperwork, all the things that we've been talking about so far, they kind of fit under this umbrella of the European Student Card Initiative. Um, really to you know, make it more inclusive, smoothen the mobility experience, um, and, and all, of these, all of these sort of things. I will dive more specifically within, um, within the European Student Card, right? because this is what we've been working on. But just for you to know, there's a lot more within this landscape that is happening in, in the same time. Um, so the policy framework as well. I know we don't have that many policy people in the room, but some may find this interesting. How does this thing come to be? Um, this sort of started off in September 2020 when there was a communication on achieving this uh, European education area by 2025, which sort of outlined these foundations for that European student card to become a thing. Of course, before that, there, were, there was the pilot project and so on, huh? but this is the first moment where there was this institutional endorsement from the European Union that this thing needs to become a reality. In January 2022, there was other communication on the European strategy for universities that also mentioned the European student card that we're trying to implement. Uh, and then in April 2022, there's also been a, a council recommendation uh, on building bridges between all of this through a European student card. So just to illustrate that what we're working on is, is super important and has big you know, political backing as well from you know, ministers within the countries, from the European Union, um, and so on. Look, that was all the, uh, <laughs> the background out of the way. Let's have a look of, at where we stand, sort of, and what we have been doing, because we have not started from scratch, of course. This work that we've been carrying out builds on everything that people in the room here have been working on for many, many years. And I don't want to take the credit for that, because they've worked a lot harder. <laughs> uh, but just to give you an idea of, of where we stand, and then after that we can have a look more at you know, what the future will hold and where we're trying to, to bring things to. Um, so, the European Student Card, we have talked about it. Um, a couple of basic principles on, on what was decided over the years a European student card should be. So for us, it is a solution that should be added to existing student cards, very important. We're not trying to issue new cards to students or give them something else to carry around in their wallet. This should be something that's added to the card that is already issued by the, by the university. So there's no need for another piece of plastic or another digital card. Um, there is a centralized digital platform, a central database to store the cards that are issued, mainly used to validate these cards when people go to other places. Um, and basically, this, this allows you know, institutions that participate to generate their student cards and validate student status when they get a student card that is from someone else. We do this through a couple of elements. So you see here the pictures. Um, on the one hand, there's European student card hologram that you may have seen already in some of the presentations before, which is a, a visual way to recognize the card and also validate that this is a European student card. Um, then we have a European student card QR code that has been debated a lot already. Um, but this is the way today that we validate European student cards and make sure that everyone understands how to read them, right? So it, it's a common format in which everyone knows how to expect that QR code can be read. Um, we also incorporated, incorporated the European student identifier that you have heard about, which is this unique identifier that students carry with them. But in addition to that, we believe there should be a European student card number or something related to the specific card that we're issuing mainly because there are use cases where you know, cards get stolen, we want to block one, we want to issue a new one, and doing that on an ESI basis is just very difficult, right? Because this is supposed to stay throughout the life of the student. So we think it's necessary to have another identifier there that identifies that particular card so that you can have multiple instances over time. Um, looking a little bit at how this is at the moment, we have around 1.6 million uh, active cards. So these were cards issued, registered in the router that can be validated um, across, across Europe. Um, there's 195 institutions that are issuing cards spread out over these 12 countries. Um, there is a, a strong presence in France, though. <laughs> this needs to be mentioned because this is also, and in Italy, this is where the heritage of this project lies, so where the adoption has been earlier, sort of. 
Um, and of course, the reality of the European student card also needs to be adjusted to other countries so that it works within their context. Huh? Um, then we have 557 institutions or card issuers, as we call them, registered uh, in the system. Um, and out of these, there are, so there are 3.8 million holograms requested. Now, a common question is, why are there more holograms requested than there are cards issued? Um, this is really because the card can also be issued with only a hologram if you want to do this in the simplest way. Registering it, adding a QR code to it is more work, and that's why less people have gone through that process. We do hope in the future that more people go through that process, though, because this adds you know, important features of, of validation and so on. But we could therefore say that there are 3.8 million European student cards in use that students show, that students have, that carry that logo on it, that carry that hologram, which is important. Um, now, we, how we have been sort of approaching this in terms of turning this into a European Commission service. So going from uh, an Erasmus Plus funded project into something that's managed by, by the Commission. We have been working sort of in, in five fields um, where we are now in 2023 sort of distinguishing these things in, in five fields. And I want to mention them because there's a lot more than just technical infrastructure. I mean, we are all technical people. It's easy to see, ah, oh, there's only like a technical challenge. But the adoption challenges go way beyond that, right? There's so much more than just the technical challenges. So for us, an important strength is the strategic planning and governance. So making sure that the right people are involved in the right decisions regarding this initiative. The IT infrastructure, of course, I don't have to explain why this is important. Training and support, uh, making sure that people get trained on how to use, how to issue cards, but also provide support when people encounter issues. Um, an important topic for this year is also the innovative technologies and foresight strength, where we need to see what the future holds and how we can adjust to this, incorporate this. We have already heard some great ideas going into directions like digital credentials, more decentralized digital cards, uh, etc. These are things that, that need to be more investigation and also need some, some decision making, right? So this is, this is happening there. Um, and of course, there's a, a whole outreach part that we need to tell you about all the stuff that is happening uh, and how cool the European student card is, otherwise no one would want to issue them. So this is a bit what we're working on in, uh, uh, in the next year. And, you know, to have a, a more sort of detailed overview of what our main tasks are for, for 2023. Um, in terms of the innovative technologies and foresight, I think this is the most interesting for all of you in the room, basing myself on the discussions that we have had yesterday and today, um, is really to analyze and conduct research on what technologies are out there and how can we bridge them. What is the most common a way that universities can implement this so that we don't have to, you know, fight of like, okay, this is, this works for me, but it doesn't work for you. And that we offer as much possibilities, you know, to sort of align and, and converge together. Um, analyze the challenges, the, the different types of services that are offered. Um, other, you know, like innovation, innovative initiatives like the, uh, the wallet that we've been talking about or the blockchain service infrastructure. Uh, these sorts of things, and sort of pilot these with European University Alliances. We think that European University Alliances are sort of the first one that, are, that have really woken up that this is something that we need. So it's very good to work with them, with you, um, to make this a reality and to test this out. Uh, because if it works in European University Alliances, it likely works also for the more traditional uh, mobility exchanges that are happening. There's a lot more details here that, that I won't get into. You will get the slides after, so you can give it a read if you want to see what is exactly what is exactly up. Huh? Um, and sort of like this is the, the four-year plan that we have in terms of the longer-term roadmap. I know people are asking me a lot what is going to happen in the future. You know, how, when is this going to be a reality, and how are we getting there? This is sort of the rough plan that we have, right? So the first objective that we had was to improve the infrastructure and to comply with European standards. This is sort of what's been completed now. We have taken the heritage that was there, the great concepts that are being used by many universities out there, and we have re-implemented this into a um, infrastructure that's compliant with European Commission standards, branding, uh, and it will be run on their infrastructure as well. Now, 
ensured and this progressive approach towards onboarding more services, supporting more technologies and so on. This is something that we are sort of ongoing now starting with. Um, of course, this needs to be figured out. Eh? It will run throughout the, the full duration of, of the four years that we have. Provide the right support, engage the stakeholders, um, you know, promote it, and really raise awareness of, of what we're doing. So this is a little bit the, again, sort of the same strengths that we're working in, but more, you know, plotted out over time. Um, now, more concretely, what we have been doing in, in terms of the router migration to the European, uh, to the European Commission, we've basically redesigned and implemented uh, a new scalable data model. So we have checked what is now there in the European student card router. How can we make this more privacy preserving, more you know, scalable? How can we deal with higher volumes of cards? So this is one of the things. There's a new user, user interface, which will look very uninspiring to some of you, because this is a standard commission tool, it's also a standard commission front-end framework, and it will look like any tool of the European Union, um, which, which is good. Huh? I think that gives it the recognition and credibility that, that it needs. Um, well, develop all the components, you know, backwards compatibility APIs and all these sorts of things that we are working on, and then hosting it on the European Commission uh, cloud, on the DG Digit Managed Cloud. And to give you a bit of inside information, most of this has been completed at this point. The main challenge we're facing today is with the last part, because of course this asks for a lot of alignment between us and the European Commission to make sure that this can be hosted on, uh, on that infrastructure. And we're kind of a first within the higher education sphere to move this to, to the Commission control. But we believe it will have great advantages for everyone that this is you know, hosted in a environment that percent sure is secure and safe and so on. Um, now, a little bit more about sort of the functionalities and the way we validate this. Um, I mean, this slide can be expanded a lot more into the future, huh? but we say right now that we have more or less five ways of validating a European student card, um, as were sort of defined in the, in the pilot project and the work that was done before, huh? where we have the hologram, as I mentioned, which is good for you know show and go use cases where we want to show a card we don't really mind if it's not valid or not it's it's a very simple and easy way the advantage is that this is universal right we just have to look at it with our eyes and there's nothing else that we have to do no infrastructure required the downside is though that there's no real validation happening i mean we're looking at the hologram so we know that this is a card but we don't know if it's expired we don't know if it's stolen we don't know if the student you know, quit his studies and these sorts of things. So, so these are challenges that we have. Then we have the level one, which is well, widely deployed right now. It's the, the QR code validation, which is this sort of simple validation by, by scanning the QR code that points you to a website that gives some additional information on this card is valid, it's been issued by this university, and it's valid until that date. The good thing about this, as sort of unsecure and simple as it is, is that everyone with a smartphone can do this. And even more so after the pandemic, because we all now know how to scan a QR code, right? So also bookstores um, or the, the easier, you know, like museums, these sorts of use cases, they can very easily validate a card in, in level one, um, where they get a little bit more information, right? Now, where things get interesting is, you know, level two, level three, uh, level four. Level two is the API validation, which, which already exists. Now we have an API available where you can validate European student card numbers, which means that technically you can attach certain things to that in your back office system at the university. So you could add, you know, a cafeteria balance or a library debt or books that were borrowed and these sorts of things to that particular number. And the advantage of linking that to the European student card number is that you can do that as well for visiting students that come with a card that is not issued by you, right? Um, and now this is where things get even more abstract, you know, level three and level four, it's to have the chip in the card uh, sort of standardized so that it includes the same information. And level four, to even do this offline using cryptography so that we can use this to open doors that may not be connected to the internet and so on. Now. Because the complexity increases, the higher we get. Um, for now, we are focusing on level zero to level two, so the first three that are sort of easy to implement. 
And together with all the stakeholders that we identified, we're looking more into level three and four, because these may need to be polished a bit. They may need to be revisited so that we are sort of all on the same page on, on how we do that. The ultimate goal in the end is that, you know, as many of us in the room agree on how we make a student card and how we store the data on it, so that we also all know how to read the card from each other and can easily use that to, you know, offer services within our libraries, cafeterias, and, and other things that we offer. Um, another thing that we've been working on is, you know, like we've been mapping out sort of the situation in the different countries. So a, a question that we come and get is like, oh, but what about Berlin? What about my specific uh, university? Or, or what about my country? We've been trying, you know, throughout the last year to really sort of map out how the situation is in each country. What are the strengths and weaknesses? Are there central bodies that are issuing cards that we could collaborate with and, you know, roll this out in one go? Are cards issued by universities? Do we have particular, you know, data protection issues? Really to, well, to see what we have to do to make this rollout a success. So to assure you, we're, we're trying to, you know, really see how it is in your country. And this data has been validated with national agencies within the different countries as well, so that we make sure this is correct and constantly updated throughout the work that we are carrying out. We've also carried out an online survey. I don't know how many of you have participated in this. I have a feeling that many of you might may have. Thank you for that, because we got a lot, a lot of responses. And the good thing is that this gave us a little bit more insights in what technologies are used, how do you offer your services, what kind of chip brands do we have, uh, these, these sorts of questions, but also more in sort of a stakeholder uh, management point of view. Eh? So we had four main audiences that were targeted. We had the students that filled it in, management that filled it in, IT officers that filled it in, and IROs, so that we would get the perspective of each of them on, on what student cards would be used for. Um, we've also been working on the European Student Card website. And I think this one is important to, to sort of bookmark because this is where all the latest information is, is coming out. Uh, in the past, there were a lot of different websites for the different projects that were a part of the initiative somehow. So there was a My Academic ID website, there was a European Student Card website, there was an EWP website. What we're now trying to do together with all these projects is to really put this information on the European Student Card Initiative website, which is part of the Commission website. Um, and really put all the information there. So I would also like recommend you to check that because what I'm presenting today is sort of the state of play as it is today, but this will reflect the state of play in the future as well as, as time progresses. Um, and then we're also working on you know the support and guidance. These are things that right now we are heavily focusing on. It's the the sort of guidance materials that are there, FAQs that we, that we need to offer. We have a help desk available that is right now through email. This is also in the progress of being upgraded to a proper you know, issue tracking so that we can respond faster. But if you do have any questions, you can always email us at esc.support at entitydata.com. You may actually leave out this email uh, part. <laughs> Both work. Where we have, to, to give you an idea, huh, we have received around 600 requests between March and December. 50% um, of these were, you know, related to new registrations. So important to mention maybe is that we have been receiving a lot of new registrations throughout the last years, even though we haven't fully migrated the infrastructure yet to the, to the new uh, commission-based environment. Um, yeah, I think that, that's it what I sort of had for you. I have a couple of Slido questions for you that are very similar to what we asked you in the survey, but I'm just very curious about the audience here, right? Are you in your institution already issuing European student cards? I know some of you are, I know some of you are not. Just to get a bit of a feel of, uh, of what the room is like. Um, and maybe we can also discuss a little bit later, you know, why you are doing this or, or why not. I need to have a look at the time as well. I hear it's fine. <laughs> So I see the majority here is no. That means we have work to do, huh? <laughs> ah, it's increasing, okay, okay. <laughs> this is more or less what I, what I would expect uh, though, eh? like I think, yeah, one third, yes. 
Now, we also need to acknowledge that we may be biased, tell it in this room, because we have all been working on student cards and the European Student Card Initiative for a long time. So <laughs> it's normal that for us, a relatively high percentage has heard of the, of the project, what we're doing, and has potentially implemented this. But it's a, it's a good result, huh? Oh, I see it's even getting better. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, now, since it's more focusing on, on digital cards, I'm also curious to see who of you are, are doing this in a digital way. Um, I know there are by far more cases out there of European student cards that are physical, so the QR code and the hologram is added to the physical cards. We know of the example of Victoriano who did it all in pixels. <laughs> but I, <laughs> exactly. Hologram in pixels that doesn't exist yet. Okay, okay. This gives a good, uh, good overview as well. I also take it from here, knowing that there are not that many that have done it, is that the majority is probably most interested in in doing this, right? So to adopt the European Student Card in your digital car uh, first. Okay. okay. Moving to, uh, to the next question, and, and then it's time for you to ask me questions. So I will prepare you already mentally. If you have things, you can leave them in the Q&A. Um, but important for us to know as well, to sort of have an idea what to focus on. When, when we talk about the um, functionalities of the European Student Card, I would be curious which is the most important for you. Of course, these we are aware that all of them should eventually be covered. So our aim is really to cover all of this by 2025, um, but in order to boost adoption, it's of course important to focus on the things that are most important in the first place, right? And we always believe that it's better to do things well than to do them quick and hastily and in a, in a, in a broad way. So I will leave you some time because I know this one, this one takes a bit of time to complete. I see seven people are ranking though. <laughs> Okay, so mostly the library services, campus facilities, and then the transport. This is, I think, what we've been talking about for, for the last days as well. Eh? It's mostly the, uh, the on-campus things that are often, often provided by the university or you know, a body that's closely linked to the university. Okay, okay, very good. Well, um, let's move on to the, to the q and I don't think we have a lot of time, so I will, I will try to be efficient, but so far I only see, see one question. Um, can you share the results of the survey? I would have to check this with my colleagues that have, that have worked on it. So personally, I'm, I'm more technically minded. I have not been involved in the analysis of the, of the survey results, uh, but I think they were, they were planned to be, to be published in, in some sort of form, right? Since we got a lot of responses, I don't think we were planning on sharing the raw results. If you would be interested in that, I can put you in contact with the team, um, just because they are you know, very difficult to read and, and there's a lot of information there. But yeah, okay. If there are no further questions, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was helpful somehow, and if you have further questions, feel free to look for me later. <laughs> Okay, now I will use this one, otherwise the other one we have to, to switch it on again. So the e-card, no plastic please, very much agree. Eh? <laughs> so far, um, our approach in all of this has been that whatever we develop should be agnostic, whether this is a, a plastic, a paper, or a digital card. So all the, the technologies that we've developed, the QR code, the, the sort of the standards, they shouldn't matter. Now, what we were saying, there's no re not really a hologram that is ready for, for the pixels yet. We are working on that to you know, make sure that this can be deployed on, on all different platforms. But really the idea is that you should add this to your card that you already have, whatever that is. If that's a piece of paper, if that's a piece of plastic, if that's a chip that's in your arm, all good, huh? <laughs> um, and then uh, the last one, is the hologram mandatory? This is a, it's a good question, but it's also a bit of a tricky one. Because 
Today, if you do not put the hologram there, it will not be possible for people to recognize that this is a European student card, and it's kind of defeating the purpose, right? A, a QR code today could be anything. It could really be your COVID certificate, or it could be the program for this conference. Um, so it's important that uh, we add the hologram to it today to sort of give this recognition, to give this brand value that people see, hey, this is a European student card, and I can validate it and recognize it in that way. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> but it, w it would be very much recommended to do so, huh? Eh? Yeah, yes, of course, but uh, the, the, one of the issues for me is uh, if this is mandatory or not. No, no. So what we're trying to do in, in all of this initiative, to be very honest with you, is to, to make nothing really mandatory. Everything is highly recommended, of course. Eh? Okay. But it's really to sort of offer the most ideal solution that you can implement, you knowing your students best, right, and, and knowing the landscape of your university best. So I don't know how your card looks, but if you think it is clear without including the hologram, this is, this is a possibility. Okay. Right. Thank you. And I see we can do holograms in the Google Wallet. That's great news, huh? So, so, so maybe it would be possible to, to, to uh, offer as uh, uh, an image or a logo uh, yeah. as an alter alternative for, for the hologram. We are working on it a bit because we would like it to be a little bit more than, than just an image. Um, the idea is really that the hologram needs to be used to do this visual validation. And you know, when we talk about a physical card, if you have seen the hologram, there is a bit of a, like if you, if you move the light, you see that it changes, right? This cannot be done, cannot be done digitally like that, but at least some moving elements should likely be introduced so that you know, it is possible to validate the card just based on looking at that image. Huh? I see maybe Jean-Paul wants to add some things. <laughs> no, no, it's because I see the last question about the link between the Erasmus ah. app and the ESC. Of course, this is a, a, a strong discussion we have between lot one and lot two. Uh, I mean, uh, led by the European Commission. That is, that is that the. the a student card for us, it's what you issue in this institutions. And it becomes a European student card. So for us, obviously, the, we must have a link between what Erasmus app says as a, a European card, a student card, and the real European student card. If not, nobody will understand what, what's, what's going on. For us, this is our point of view, and this is a discussion we have currently uh, inside the governance uh, around the European Commission. Eh? But, but we're working together very closely eh, to make this a reality. So what you're saying is it's very right, and, and we're trying to solve this together with all the parties involved to, to make this work. I see another question. Discussion to be had needs more identity validation. Ah, okay, okay. I see, I see, I see. Very good. Yeah, apparently there is a scroll. Individual card. So this is the question that John Paul just answered, right? Can the virtual card visualized be considered a European student card? It's a little bit tricky today because there are two different cards and they're issued in two different types of ways. As I said, we are working on aligning them as much as possible so that this becomes clear to, to everyone. Huh? Uh, and I think that's it, right? At least as a logo. Yeah, yeah. It was an answer, uh, Victoriano said, it was an answer to the, the cart in the app kind of discussion as well. But yeah, I see we're also running out of time exactly now, so thank you very much for, for your attention and for all the questions. Feel free to come look for Jean-Paul, myself. Manel is actually also here, who's also involved in the project. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to come and, uh, and harass us later. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Entity data. Okay, we go back to uh, last panel of works. So... Uh, I would, I would like to invite our speakers for the panel discussion to the stage. So, Tamas Molnar from the Humboldt University of Berlin, Victoriano Girard 
from the University of Malaga, Mr. Alexander Löscher from the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, and Sam Jones from Ela <laughs> sorry? Seen, sorry. From Elatec GmbH. Please what what seating? Please? <laughs> but it's very warm. Today. Sam is from NXP uh, London. Uh, England. Oh, it's clearly from London, England. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful accent. Yeah. Yeah. You're the moderator? Okay. <laughs> I'm the moderator. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so, um, this will be our last topic today, um, and uh, we will have a discussion about the future of um, student IDs with a couple of um, questions to start a uh, discussion. And the idea would be that not only we discuss it, but also the audience, so that we have uh, some kind of, of question answer, and uh, you don't get bored, and um, we, have, we get some probably fruitful in input and ideas um, for the future of student cards. So um, the first question was, it's not on the, is it on, on, on the, nope, okay. it's not, okay. That's a thing. Okay, so. <laughs> you you um, want to find something in the computer? No, it's okay. okay. So um, the first question is, uh, in west, which direction does it go? So. Um, and what will happen um, with um, student IDs? So currently most, I suppose, over 90% of um, institutions use a card, a physical card, and um, want to go to a um, digital card. There is a big question, at least for us, that how to go completely digital because there will be students who, will, who don't want to use a card, who says, okay, I just want to use a smartphone. Uh, I have a private smartphone, but I don't want to use it for, for my uh, university card. So what do you do? So, and that, that would be the first question um, and first topic. Okay, we, we ask them, do you have Facebook? If they answer yes, we say, okay. <laughs> It's your problem. If they answer, no, I have a very old um, phone and I don't have Facebook, I don't use Google, I don't uh, book things, I don't, don't use Uber or any other service, then we try to find something and provide them with some plastic thingy that has very few services. Sorry, you are living in the dark ages and we are sorry, the, the world is moving. You know, it's, we can agree or not, I'm not very much in, in some parts of the digitalization of the world, but it's happening. So it's like I, you say, well, I don't wear clothes. Uh, well, for me, um, as I said yesterday, the sole focus on students is a bit weird because in, in universities, especially... Uh, focus on the person. Uh, focus on the person, and uh, at least the PhD-seeking persons are normally uh, faculty staff members, so they are employees, so they're not going under the line of a student anymore from the definition, but they are the one on the move more normally a lot, and they should be included. And the one thing is, so if you're uh, talking with the people, it's maybe, Germany is probably one of the countries where they are more concerned about sharing their data, uh, getting What's the real term in English? Gläserner Mensch? Uh, glass, uh, glay, uh, glay, um, completely identifying human body where you can track <coughs> everything. So in the end, we see how the government goes into that direction and every single step. 
I think it's the dis point of discussion at the moment. By the time it's because they, people see how that digital possibilities gives you more and more flexibility and they will accept it over the time. But you have to explain them. So the technology is not really the problem, it's always the communication. That's the thing. So making a lot of websites, videos, explaining them why we are doing it this way, uh, how we secure your data and everything. So it's, uh, from my point of view, not a question in the long term that the people and the students will accept a digitized card. It's just a question of the time necessary when? for it. When? Oh, yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, I've seen James here from NXP. Uh, we've got like solutions in 1,500 campuses, and what's for sure is the education and training piece is very important. It's not uh, a big bang, and then look at the fallout and see what works and what doesn't. There is definitely a transitional piece, and it's not just in the education and understanding of the solutions. As uh, the guy from NTT mentioned earlier on, the infrastructures, the setup, that process going through um, that transformation is very important. And we see a lot of people um, favoring looking at digital identity. Uh, we also see a lot of people wanting to have a hard credential um, and have it virtualized on the digital credential as well. Um, so they've got that best of both worlds. But to, to, to uh, bring up to the first gentleman who, who mentioned about, hey, they've got to take it, that we're moving into the modern world. Clearly, the educational piece is very important. I don't think it's a case of force feeding uh, the students a mobile phone to use as their access control point, but, all, but to more to show them the benefits and, and grow it into that way. I must what would you say from the Berlin perspective on it? So um, I don't see this as as easy as as Victoriano, um, and and, and I am so me personally, um, I am completely on 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 your side, and and I see that uh, people should be and and can be probably uh, persuaded to to do this if you if you communicate it right. Um, that's one side of me. The other side, so that's the optimistic side, so let's just say. Um, and there is a realist in me um, who, who works in Berlin and uh, sees all the students. And, and let's just say 90 to 95% of the students can be, can be persuaded and they, they will see the, that that's the future. And they essentially, so I suppose that, that uh, about 80% will, will jump on the opportunity and say, okay, let's do it it's it's the future it's cool let and and it it helps me um like the 10 20, 20 10 to 15% can be persuaded can be they they will eventually switch to smartphones and there are the 5% the last 5% and these 5% of students they are for example for berlin so we have like I told yesterday, 150,000 in 10 universities. And we have very different universities in this group. We have three um, technical universities, small technical universities uh, with uh, 10 to 15,000 students. They are no problem. They had absolutely also no problem uh, introducing the card or introducing any new service. No problem. The students jump on the opportunity and use it. Then we have the the medical university, it's also no problem. We have some, some more questions and, and you have to communicate them uh, in other terms than to the technical people. That's also no problem, it's solvable. And then we have the two big, they called full universities in Germany. So they, they, these are the universities who are not, uh, they don't have engineering but, and medical studies, but everything else. And the problem is the everything else. So they have um, a couple of uh, faculties which are which um, house this, the the more difficult students. And there, I know about two uh, faculties or two institutes who they are more the most difficult. One of them are the music uh, studies, and the other one is uh, is um, the uh, humanities. And in these, the students are very skeptical of everything which is more advanced than the AIM issues. Um, so 
they might use Facebook, but they have no idea what they are doing with it. But, and everything what the university wants to feed them is, is evil. So we are, we are, we are essentially the, uh, the evilest thing in their eyes, and, and we, are, we are the establishment, and, and we, are, we have to be uh, fought against. Um, these are the students who sometimes, if they are really fed up, um, occupy some, some rooms until the police uh, takes them out, um, and, and so on. So these, these kind of guys. And these, will, these students will flatly refuse to use it. And if you f try to force them, they will sue the university and probably um, will win because um, you, they would have to use their own private device, essentially, to have um, use a, a service of the university. And the problem is, at least in, in Berlin, probably it's only a Berlin problem, I don't know. But the student card is defined by law in, in, in Berlin by the um, local higher education law that they ha have to have a student card. They have to, we have to provide them a student card. <laughs> uh, or a student ID, sorry, not a card, an ID. It doesn't say, say it's a physical card. We can give them anything. So, and, but it, they doesn't, the higher education law doesn't say that they, ha don't ha that they have to use a smartphone. So they will say, give us a physical card. And they are essentially, from the law standpoint, from a legal standpoint, they have the right to get a physical card. And there will be some people, some students, who will say, I want a physical card. And what we do then is a big question mark currently. And, so and there are, you have to provide it for, for free? You have to provide it for free. OK. And it has to be a card? No, it has to be some kind of idea. It can be. Uh, written on their foreheads, it's no no <laughs> difference. So we can give them a piece of paper, a parchment. Uh, uh, we can give them a, a piece of fur, or I don't know what. But it has to be find, sub find, uh, find the find the cheapest thing that you can put an, an RFID inside and a QR on top <laughs> yeah. of it, and provide them with that. That's your your ID. So what are get our, lost? We have we have two two ideas currently, which are. Uh, uh, thought about one is that we still we will still uh, give out um, physical cards for them, but make it so uncomfortable that it it is so they are, it will be only possible to get it uh, in two hours so one hour a week or two hours a week and and at i don 't know total crazy office hours. Um, so you can get it, and the law doesn't say we have to provide them 24/7 or something like that. It it have to be it possible to get it. That it's uncomfortable. It's your private problem, not ours. Um, and the um, so to to nudge them to to use uh, some modern technology. Um, and the other thing is um, that will probably uh, diminish the number to a to a very small number, and th those. Will, uh, will be lent some kind of cheap 100 euro or 80 euro smartphone from the university uh, for like 50 euro deposit and then they don't they can use that one and we will probably solve it this this way I don't I don't think the, your end goal you're talking about is everyone to have a mobile phone because you, you think that's the, that's the pretty neat thing to do and all, all the rest of it. But I think there has got to be you know, with the training and education of those students the majority will be taking up the opportunity to use their mobile phone. Is it not manageable, the remainder who are using the cards? Is it a, is it, is it a you know, everything or, you know, or nothing type scenario? No, the problem is, <coughs> as for us at least, um, so uh, um, the problem is that if even one student remains um, who is using a physical card, we have to still um, maintain the physical card infrastructure. So the, the card printers, the card revalidation process, we have to order cards. That's the, the smallest problem because the card, it's not the, no, it's not the small problem because, because cards don't have a indefinite shelf life, as we learned a couple of uh, weeks ago or a couple of months ago. 
um, to, because of the um, pandemic, uh, our cards sat on the shelf longer than normally, and we gave them out, and now they are peeling. Uh, so the the lamination of the cards yeah. uh, is, peeling is, is peeling off because they sat on the shelf like for three or four years. Normally, they have a shelf life uh, of one year or, or ma two years at maximum, then we give them out and until the student destroys it, it's like two years or something like that or three years, um, and they get a new one. Um, and the, they don't get that old as that now they get, and they are, um, they are peeling, out, uh, the, peeling off. Um, so um, the problem is that even if one student remains of the 150,000, uh, we have to maintain the whole infrastructure for them, and it's, it's expensive. But it's, a, it's a smaller, inf if it's a smaller quantity, surely it's a smaller thing that you're maintaining, though. It's like, uh, uh, yes, and it's maybe much, you're transitioning? Yes, it's much. It's not, um, so we are talking not about the, the immense operation we are currently doing for the, for the students, but but we will have to, so you don't, you cannot have one printer. You have to have multiple printers because one printer can, can fail. Um, you have, you, you have to have a car, so the, 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 the ribbons for the printers, the cleaning materials for the printers, the, the staff who do, does, does all this so, stuff. So surely you have disabled students or special needs yeah. students who can't use a mobile phone or look at the screen or something like that. How do you cater for that? That, then, so? that would be the next, my next question for, <laughs> for today. <laughs> so, well, you, I think if we are th thinking about <coughs> the situation we have at the moment, <coughs> the vision is going into that European level so that you actually can be on the move, but the actual situation we have is right. those people that do not want to use the smartphone or agree, uh, using the card extensively, they are the person or, uh, that don't go on the move. So you can even give them a very cheap card handing out. Yes, you have to maintain some infrastructure, but in the end it's you can convince a lot of the people by explaining them and mo giving them some support. And uh, in some discussion with some partners from us in America, it was really like the discounts they even get on an iPhone is cheaper to issue them a governmental issued iPhone to the students than yeah, we certainly, maintaining uh, we a certainly, card infrastructure. Yeah, we certainly see working with uh, various um, OEMs where when they look at university um, solutions, they look at incentives to give subsidized yeah. handsets, and, and, but you're still in that catchment of people who want it and yeah. people who don't want it. So I, I, I can <laughs> offer you uh, a couple of ideas. We found a service that it's not compulsory to provide that it's, it only works if you can scan a QR code. And that's a parking lot. It's not a compulsory thing. So <coughs> either you can open the gate with your phone, or you don't park. It's not compulsory uh, service from the, for the university to, to the people in the university. So you can park if you want, but you, can, you have to do it with the app. That's it. If not, well, don't park. And the other one is a procedural. We have decided that anyone wanting a plastic card has to visit the secretary general, the provost, the, the office, go there, present your ID, they verify that you belong to the university, and then when, with a very small, slow printer, they print you a card. And it has to be from nine to two only one place in the university. No problem, you can get it. Come here, we will verify you as you and that you belong to the university, be a professor, a student, or whatever, because professor, uh, professors are worse than the students with these. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Wait on mine. We will issue you a beautiful card because we, have, uh, we bought uh, 500 of them provided by the, the bus company, very cheap half an euro with a special design so they look beautiful and you can use them in the, in the bus and it's my fare, it's beautiful, nice. You go there to the office of the uh, Secretary General and you get it. Nine 
to two. City center, not the big campus. It's a bit uncomfortable, but that's your problem. <laughs> Use your phone. <laughs> Procedural uh, tactics. <laughs> any, any insights uh, from, the from the audience? Any thoughts? <laughs> Like, yeah, there was time where, when we had no cards, right? Everyone had paper. Yep. So everyone moved to plastic at some point of time and it became mandatory. Yep. So what's the difference now moving to di digital out of plastic? It's the same? It's the same. It just takes some time and it will not be finished within the no, next uh, three months. It will probably take 10 is, years or something. I think the problem is the ownership of the device. Yes. We move from, from card to plastic, from paper to plastic, at some day you got <coughs> issued a plastic thing instead of a paper thing. No problem. But now we issue the card on something that the person owns. It's not the university who owns the thing. So it's, it's simple posturing, I think. I don't own a phone. That's a huge lie. We have found it over the, the pandemic. One of the solutions was that there were people living in towns with no decent coverage. So they couldn't use internet teaching. And we set up uh, phone classrooms. So you could ring a 900 at free. Uh, if you didn't have even a way of getting free phone calls because you were only in, in places where you couldn't get that. We set up a free number because we were not making outgoing calls. So the money we were spending in outgoing calls was reversed in receiving calls. So you could drink. So no one was out. So at least you had a phone. <laughs> so we found that the whole population in the university had a phone. We didn't have to provide phones. We provide laptops to people without money. We provided lines for internet access, but no one asked for a phone. So it's clear. When someone says, I don't own a phone, you can say, you liar. <laughs> so I think in the end, it's all a question of convenience. And right. in the beginning, like Misha said yesterday, it, when they start using the payment in the phone, they're getting more and more uh, convenient with it. If they're using it for transport tickets, they're becoming more, they're using it. It's just, it takes time. And actually, the same thing started, is starting now in schools that the public transport systems issuing the tickets as a smartphone app for free. Or, or a QR code. Or a QR code in the phone. but. If they are got familiarized with that, it's just the time that is necessary to go. But I agree with you. The students are, or 99% of the students are not a problem, but 30% of the older professors, especially from something like arts, like uh, the spiritual, so theological, even, or something. Even the tech people. Yes. But some of the tech people, were, talking to us, no, I don't even use uh, whiteboard. I use chalk in my class. You are techie, okay. No, they're mathematicians. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> it's no joke. Mathematicians still use chalk. Yeah. yeah. Well, even, even engineers do. Yeah. Or at or least they say they do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. may sound a bit provocative, but uh, regulations can be changed, and this regulation requiring you to issue cards seems to be the source of your problem. <laughs> well, so uh, let's do it with the uh, law we have in Bavaria, for example. It stated the uh, university has to issue uh, the students a document <coughs> that uh, verifies that they are enrolled in the university. 
That's the only mandatory thing there. So it doesn't say it needs to be a paper document or a card or something. And the student card actually is an optional offering of the university to make it more convenient. And we have around 55,000 students. 50 don't get their card. 50. But it's just because they are not sitting in Germany. They don't need the card. For us, it's a little bit more, um, but not much. We have the problem other way around. We have a lot of students who enroll to the university to get the card. Because currently in, in Berlin, you don't have to do anything as a student, and you can study years, years and years and years. <laughs> and for free. For, not for free. You have to pay the semester fees. That's 250 euros or 300 euros or something. But you get a semester ticket for Berlin ABC. So it's not, Berlin, not only Berlin, but the, the metropole region. And it's a, about half a price or less than half a price of the normal price for this ticket. So it's a lot of them <laughs> do it for the ticket. And we um, have seen this uh, during the pandemic um, that um, we um, opened the entrance to the revalidation, the ticket revalidation, uh, only um, between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. And we got a lot of students, students, <laughs> who said, yeah, I don't have the time to go to the machine between Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, I'm working. I'm working. So <laughs> we thought about, yeah, guys, uh, if you're working so much, how do you study? Um, yeah, but... but... I study by night. Yeah, probably. <laughs> well, actually, uh, we have the same problem, but we could verify uh, on some points, especially as we do have a very huge medical faculty. This, uh, the uh, students in the practical semesters in the clinics, they actually don't have the time to go in certain hours, so there's possibility it is for that. Yeah, but but what we, ha we have the same problem. There are lots of fake students that want the ticket or access to the library. Yeah, and that's the other thing. You get a, a really, really cool stuff from the library, and um, you can access it when you're a student. And essentially, if you're a student in Berlin at one of the universities, you can access all uh, libraries in Berlin. And uh, it's a big incentive um, to be a student, and it's it's cheap. So now you know the secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I can become a, a Berlin student. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. No problem. I can. So you have to ch you have to get a um, you have to matriculate in a in a direction which has no uh, numerous clauses. That means that, for example, physics or mathematics, the most most uh, na uh, natural sciences don't, um, and um, physics is very, very popular. So we have a really large number of physics students who, who are only students on paper. I like physics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it's for the streaming. Yes. Okay. For the you have recording. no public access to your libraries. There is. There is, however, um, it is limited. So it's not the same as for the students. Students get more access than, um, than if you walk in as a walking user. And um, even um, there are some things that only, only local students can do, that even you have to be, for example, a student at Humboldt uh, to use the learning cubes at Humboldt because of the uh, very convenient location of our, our main library, uh, if we would open it to all students in, in Berlin, and this is, a, this is a political discussion between the university vice presidents, which is brewing since, I don't know, since the, the library has been opened 10 years ago. Um, why don't you open it for us? Yeah, because you don't want to pay for it, and that, that is essentially the discussion uh, since then, um, that you have to use these, these facilities, you have to be a student at Humboldt. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just a thought, I guess I'm reflecting upon what, what the colleagues said here as well. I think it's, 
in the end of the day, it's really a question about what we want and what is sort of morally okay to, to do to students because laws can be changed. I think we have good contacts with, with policymakers. I'm also thinking about, you know, the future European student card and how, you know, this may streamline things and, and you know, make this sort of laws more aligned. So maybe it's a, it's a question for you. Do you if, if everything would be possible, what do you think is, is morally okay to, to do? Is it, is it morally okay to not give them a physical card anymore if they, if they want it? Because for me, this is, this is more the question. Huh? Like, I think you can make it very difficult for them. You can change laws. There's many things that you can do to, to get there. That's sort of why we are in the room together and we can probably work towards. If everything would be possible, what would you do? I'm actually uh, not a fan of punishing people for uh, wanting something else. So the problem is normally not that they are unwilling or something, but they don't understand it. So uh, most of the people, uh, it takes the time to explain them what they can do with it and everything, and you can convince a lot of the people with it. And we say uh, we don't have the problem with the money, so if we issue a card that costs 10 euros, even if we go in the uh, huge line to uh, some uh, smart cards, uh, because it, the more people going into the smartphone means the lower is the amount of cards you need to buy. So then you have smart cards probably in the end that costs you 100, 150 euros. That's something the university can still afford, but tries to reduce as much as possible because explaining them how much effort is in there and if you don't really need it, they explain, okay, I take the cheap card for one euro fifty or I actually do the stuff but I'm not convinced with the phone. But yeah, then you can pay for the card and go with that. Can I, can I just add, on, on, it's a bit of a link point because I haven't mentioned it already, but surely there is um, a mechanism for special needs or disabled users, and if that yes. already exists, then that small percentage of students surely can piggyback onto that, that process or process. Yes. As for example, for, for us, we have a um, special process for, for students who cannot use the uh, automatic machines. Our automatic machines are usable as long as you can, you, so if you are blind, no problem. If you are in a, in a wheelchair, no problem. The, the machines uh, comply to the uh, standards and they are usable from a wheelchair and they are usable um, through uh, motion um, and have a feedback, audio feedback. So most blind people um, use headphones with with um, with kiosks. So also, if they use an ATM, they know they, that ATMs have uh, a headphone jack, and they put on headphones and the ATMs, uh, and they can use ATMs. Most of them. So most ATMs. Um, our machines are the same, constructed with the same principles. So they are. Um, they even have a, a motion um, capture technology. That means that they, if you are want to go it, uh, um, so continue, then you use your right hand. If you want to go back, you use your left hand. The only thing it doesn't that doesn't work is uh, is the face recognition uh, and taking a photograph because you cannot uh, tell a blind person to look into the camera. That's impossible. Um, I've talked with blind people and, and we wanted to find a solution with, with uh, audio and something like that and it's, it's impossible, That's not, that is not, not, not usable. But okay, they get a card without a photograph, it's absolutely okay. Um, as long as they have at least one functioning arm and hand, that's the only thing we need. And we have in Berlin from the 150,000 students only under 10, under 10 who, who are not in this category, who, who need really special assistance because they, are, um, they, are, uh, they don't have a functioning hand. Um, they get the card uh, by coming to the machine with a caregiver because people who are um, in this category of disablement, they have a caregiver 24-7. 
and they come to the machine and they, 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 get, they have their own help. So we don't really need a special case for, for this, even though we have. If they, if they write us an email, they get the card, they, we send the card by post to them, to the mail. We did this like with three cards since 2015, or five cards or something like that. So it's, it's, it's a absurdly low number. Even though um, this question will arise with smartphones, because um, you will have to have a process for, for disabled people to use um, your system. And um, as for smartphones, the same applies. Um, people who are um, handicapped and, um, but have a functioning hand, they can use a smartphone, no problem. So as long as, so if they sit in a wheelchair, no problem. If they, if they are, um, if they have a functioning hand, they use a smartphone anyways, so that's no problem. Um, blind people can also use a smartphone. There are possibilities and our app is also, has also uh, um, audio feedback. Um, that means they also can use the, the audio feedback on the, in the app. That's also no problem. Um, as for the very, 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 very low, low number, um, they will get, uh, then we can print a card in an office with a, with a printer uh, on a table. That's, that's like, I, like I said, it's, it's in five years, it's like five cards. It's, it's one card per year for, for the, that's, that's the amount of people. Uh, who are affected in, in 150,000. So we're talking here about a really, 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 really low number. I would actually uh, turn it the other way around. The people with disabilities are the people that most often rely on technology and almost every blind student at the LMU has a modern uh, very capable uh, uh, smartphone and using it and relying on it a lot. So they are even much more willing than other groups of yes. students to use it. So that they are not the problem. I could uh, argue probably then if with your approach having the pixels on the uh, side for a blind people, it's hard I was, to find. I was, I was thinking the about pixels. that. I was thinking about that, and at the moment, the pixels for acting in the in in the real world is for drivers, so no problem for blind people. <laughs> and thanks to this conversation, we will start thinking how we will do so a blind person can operate when we extend these to other uh, places we will we will we will have to find a way of of doing that yep so it's been a great conversation because it's inspiring so we have to find a way so a blind person can do that i, I have good connections to the blind support organization in spain so because probably as you said they use their very capable users of a smartphone. So probably their QR scanner we will have some uh, audio feedback telling them that the, uh, the QR code is in the camera and it's ready to be scanned. So probably it will not be a problem with this kind of people. They are very technologically savvy. But I will find out and tell you. Yeah. I just found out some days ago that the communication platforms, Cisco WebEx, some others may, that, may do that too, uh, send out uh, uh, ultraschall, I don't know the word in, in English, uh, ultrasound, in, ultrasound. ultrasound uh, ah. to communicate with mobile devices. So that could be an appliance to, uh, additionally to your QR codes uh, to send out some, some sort of ultrasound uh, and enable devices to uh, uh, well, if you're communicate thinking about, uh, in, in this form. Technologies like Wi-Fi aware, so a disabled person can actually uh, select the features so that if they go or reaching a point where there is an active beacon, it sends out data or to him communicating directly. Uh, if we are talking about Bluetooth bacons with a range of sometimes up to 200 meters, so that's not a po uh, the problem. 
I will find out and report back because someone who's, who was in, in, in uh, medical school with me uh, became uh, a person who trains blind people and now he specializes in something that is really difficult. He trains blind deaf people. So probably this guy knows <laughs> or if he doesn't know, he will know who knows. So I will find out because uh, I'm being so short-sighted I'm, I'm very much in, in, in uh, helping blind people. So thanks to this conversation, I said, oops, I didn't have uh, something for these kind of people, and I will find out for sure and report back through uh, Jeroen or Alex or uh, Tamash. I will report back to the group. We are nearing the end of the, of the panel. We have like five minutes. Are there any uh, questions from, from the audience? Anything uh, you would like to, to throw in the pot? More questions? So I think we, ha we have almost finished. So I would like to say thank you, thank you very much to Tamás Molnar from the Humboldt University, Vittoriano Girard from the University of Malaga, Alexander Lescher from the University of Munich, and St. James from NXP. Okay? <laughs> right now. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You.